everyone in now. Good evening, everyone. This is Mary Claire Kennedy again here um, this week. Thank you for joining us. We have a much demanded topic for you this evening, and I will introduce our speaker in a moment, just allow people to join, join the room. Um, just so you're aware, as usual, this is being recorded and the recording will be posted to the website together with the slide deck after the event uh, in the next few days. Um, the chat box you can access is at the bottom of the screen and um, our speaker will take questions. We have quite a bit to get through this evening, so we might keep try and keep questions to the end, but you're very welcome to populate the chat box as we work through this evening. Um, so I'm gonna pull up our introductory slides um, before we hand over to the speaker. Thanks, Audrey. So Audrey is here as usual in the background. Audrey helps us with any IT issues that might happen this evening or any um, particular issues you might have in terms of attending. Um, if, for, if you have any um, issues, usually the best thing to do is, is leave the room and come back in again, and that usually addresses things. So um, try and keep your microphones muted um, throughout the evening. Um, if you want at the end when we open for questions, you're very welcome to unmute at that stage if you feel it'd be easier to verbalize your question as opposed to type it. You're you're very welcome to do so. Um, as I said, this will be recorded and will be posted afterwards, and we will ask you for feedback towards the end of the session as well. We will uh, share a link with you at the end. Okay, that's it in terms of domestics. Um, moving on then to our speaker this evening, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Jonathan Morrissey. Jonathan is a community pharmacist in Clane County Kildare, um, and he has a, quite a, a good deal of experience with um, managing fertility cycles. Um, so the title of our presentation is Fer Fertility um, Pharmaceutical Care Issues. And it's a broad enough title to allow us to address a few different aspects of this, this topic this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan. Thank you very much. I will keep my camera on, but mute myself. Um, and if there are any issues, I will unmute myself. Take it away there, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Claire. Just checking you can see that okay. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So welcome, everyone. Uh, talk about a huge topic to try and condense and get it into an evening. Uh, probably one of my favorite areas of practice. Uh, as a student for five years and now almost a community pharmacist for 11 plus heading towards 12 years, 17 years of dispensing in this space and looking after over 5,000 cycles. It, it brings a lot of joy, tears, hugs, uh, complimentary cakes, bottles of wine and, you know, different journeys and successes and failures, but a huge area to try and get through quickly. Okay. Uh, just... So for a bit of background, uh, curious as to what you might think the normal pregnancy rate per month in humans is in Ireland. OK, so you have a girl meets boy, 25 years old, no medical conditions, completely healthy couple. What would you say their chances of getting pregnant on a month to month basis are? It's actually only 25 percent. When I asked this to my pharmacy staff today, and um, I got answers in the regions of, oh, it must be 100%, must be 90 plus percent, must be 70 plus percent, but it's actually only 25%. And unfortunately, the age factor is the biggest issue when it comes to fertility, conception and successful pregnancy outcomes. And roughly around the mid 30s, that 25% is getting down towards half, down around 15 odd percent. And as you get towards the 40s, it's less than 10. And then the mid 40s is getting down around the one or two percent. So the age factor is a massive barrier. Now, when it comes to fertility in Ireland and IVF, which is our main kind of topic here tonight, it's very hard to get solid data because there's so many private clinics and it's mainly private clinics at the moment. Uh, but there's about six and a half to 7,000 IVF cycles per year in Ireland resulting in about 3,000 baby births. Um, as I said, there's 26 fertility clinics nationally. And IVF in Ireland was pioneered by Professor Robbie Harrison of the Rotunda, that's the Irish methods. The first baby born actually to IVF in Ireland was in 1986, while the first baby born in the world was in 1978. The technique for IVF hasn't been invented by Patrick Stett and Robert Edwards in the 50s. Nowadays, IVF accounts for about 3% of all live births in developed countries. So it's substantial enough. In terms of success, again, it's hugely age-related. 
So it's around 50% of the female is under 35 years of age, and it's around 20% of the female is over 40 years of age. But the industry, industry success rate is around 31% across all ages. It's not cheap. It costs around 6,000 euros per cycle with a massive range, uh, depending on whether you're, you know, IUI, uh, IVF, ICSI, or FET cycles, which we'll get into later on. Thankfully, there is public funding on the way for fertility hubs for people who, who can't afford the private route. And in 2020, there was 2 million uh, set aside to commence regional establishment of fertility hubs, six having been approved. Now, I happened on you here in the news yesterday that the funding to actually push this on is now pushed back the next year till 2023. So nothing is happening here yet. And there's talk about possibly three publicly funded cycles per couple who, who don't have the means. So there's various uh, fertility problems that we can come across, but basically when a couple are not getting pregnant despite having regular intercourse with no contraception, we refer to it as infertility or subfertility. And it can affect men and women both heterosexual couples and same-sex couples, of course. Roughly one in six heterosexual experience infertility, but usually after a year of trying, about 85% will conceive naturally. And after two years, it can rise to around 95%. And trying means that they're having regular unprotected sex every few days. So when it comes to same-sex couples and individuals, they obviously need assisted fertility. And obviously there's various options they can look upon there from ovarian stimulation to the use of sperm donors, egg donors, surrogacy, plus or minus the above. Uh, I've seen many examples over the years where even a couple good friend of, my, of mine, um, they used the lady's own egg and her husband's own sperm in a surrogate where she wasn't able to carry the child herself. So that many wonderful things can be achieved. But there are a number of things that can cause fertility difficulties. Many are treatable, but unfortunately around 20% of cases, the cause remains unknown and quite frustrating for the patients and their treating specialists. Um, the decisions around what type of assisted fertility treatment depends on many things. Obviously relationship status is huge. Age is the biggest factor. You cannot get away from it. How long have, have they been trying to become pregnant and any physical findings from blood, semen or other examinations. There are two main types of fertility problems as, as defined in the fertility space. So a couple who have never been pregnant and is experience, experiencing infertility is simply primary infertility. And where the couple has had one or more previous pregnancies, but now all of a sudden is struggling to conceive is secondary infertility. The risk factors, again, we cannot get away from age. It's the number one. And it affects both men and women, but it does mainly affect women. The decrease in fertility occurs around the mid thirties. and uh, you know, when you think about it, a woman is born with all the eggs she'll ever have. And I, I always think of this, that when my first daughter was, uh, when my wife was pregnant with her, technically the potential for the grandchildren has already been created. And that when, uh, say, a woman gives birth to a child at age 30, it was an egg 31 years old almost that conceived the child. Men get away with it a little bit more. The semen produced upon ejaculation is simply 45 days old. So if a man has lived, uh, you know, a royal life, drinking alcohol, uh, drugs, abusing themselves, uh, not looking after themselves, if they clean up their act in a little over two months, the semen quality can improve with the help of good nutrition, exercise, all the good things we, we talk about. Weight is a big risk factor. So anyone with a BMI over 30 reduces fertility in both men and women. And if a woman in particular is underweight, then ovulation may be affected and she may in fact suffer from anovulation, which is no ovulation at all. STIs, of course, play a role as a risk factor. And then we have the usuals like smoking and alcohol. Uh, for women, alcohol can affect ovulation and for men, drinking too much can affect the quality of their sperm. So a kind of a guidance is that both would aim for at least two free alcohol days a week. An interesting one there is environmental factors. So exposure to certain pesticides, so maybe farmers, whatever, spraying crops, solvents. So, you know, tradespeople, painters, people working on building sites that might be working on different chemical compounds or something like that can, can, can affect fertility as well. And stress is a huge one. I mean, you will not come across a couple, uh, either heterosexual or same sex relationship or an individual who's trying to conceive, who is not stressed to the nines. It is extremely stressful. It means everything to them. And, and in severe cases, the stress 
can actually affect everything from ovulation to conception, everything. So reducing stress is a huge driver. And it's so easy to say it to someone and not necessarily easy for them to achieve when conceiving or having a child is everything to them. So there's many possible causes for fertility issues, like I said. 20% of cases, unfortunately, no cause is ever found. I think we hear an awful lot about the female factors, but they actually only account for 40%, and the male factors account for the other 40%, so it's fairly even. Medical conditions roll in here. Thyroid disease and diabetes in particular, if they're not well controlled uh, before you engage in treatment, they can lead to very scary outcomes and loss of, uh, loss of life in the pregnancy to the child uh, or difficulties with the mother. Chemotherapy, of course, can affect men and women or if men have had mumps uh, younger in life or even uh, post puberty they, they they may become sterile from that of course medications can affect fertility and as we all know certain medications are unsafe in pregnancy leading to poor outcomes or even uh, premature uh, birth uh, and difficulties from that contraception so certain types uh, may take some time to stop working uh, depot preparations and things like that. Some women can be unaffected. Some women can take up to a year for their fertility to return to normal. But contraception is, is an issue there. You know, a lot of um, couples, they, they may be using contraception up until the time they get married or they choose to have a family and they want to time when to stop the contraception and they think something should happen straight away and it doesn't necessarily work like that. And then you can have problems with sex itself, such as erectile or libido issues or if the man has a difficulty in reaching climax, uh, that's obviously a major part of being able to conceive. And then for women more so than men, physical pain during sex could, could be the issue why they, they can't uh, conceive. When it comes to infertility in women, there are many causes, of course, including items listed on the screen, such as fibroids, endometriosis, PCOS, STIs, of course, again. Uh, they would all be dressed individually you know, with the consultant. Some have surgical options, some don't. Some have medication options, some don't. So uh, it depends on the scenario, how you overcome the issue. When it comes to men, the most common cause of male infertility is simply a problem with the sperm. They may be low in number, not as mobile, they, as in swimming pony. They may look abnormal. When you look at them under a microscope, they could have an unusual head or an unusual tail, and this affects their ability to both reach and then penetrate the egg. And interestingly enough, uh, male sperm concentrations are dropping kind of dramatically in the last 40 years. They've dropped nearly 60%. And even this World Health Organization study shows the way that they have dropped. <clears throat> and then if you look at the normally formed, it, it's, it's also forming too. There's a lot more abnormalities creeping in for whatever reason. So when it comes to advising patients and as pharmacists, we probably get asked about this all the time. Um, basically, if a patient should see firstly their GP, if they have been trying for six months and failing to get pregnant, where the lady is under 35 or either partner have a health problem that could affect, sorry, over 35 and either partner have a health problem that could affect their fertility, such as diabetes or thyroid disease or anything like that. Okay. Then if they've been trying for a year and both partners are completely healthy and the woman is younger than 35, they should then go talk to a fertility specialist or their GP. And it's very uh, important that they attend to get together. Uh, a lot of the time it's left to the woman to sort it all out. But as I showed you earlier on, 40% of cases is female, 40% of cases is male, and 20 are, will remain unknown, uh, unfortunately. The GP can do various things, of course, physical exams, blood tests, STI screens. Some GPs do ultrasound and then semen analysis, all important for, for men. And that will advise the patient and what they should do next you know obviously they can go for specialist treatment and depending on what these findings show they may need to go straight for specialist help and um, when it comes to specialist investigations again they'll do a more in-depth analysis of male semen for women they'll want to know about ovulation is it regular or irregular and we'll come back to this later on they'll want to know how many eggs are left and roughly what quality have they got and when it comes to the egg reserve, there's the AMH or anti-malarian hormone. We'll come back to that. And if they have an awful lot of very small follicles, 
uh, as you see with PCOS, they'll have a difficulty conceiving. And if they have low ovarian reserve, they'll have great difficulty conceiving. And as you can see by the table, it really drops off as we march on with age. <clears throat> Anti-malarian hormone itself is a substance produced by the granulosa, granulosa cells in ovarian follicles. It's used as a, a measure which reflects the size of the remaining egg reserve. It's used by consultants along with the AFC or antral follicle count. So the antral follicle count is something that's looked at using intravaginal um, ultrasound. And they look at the size or the, the amount of follicles forming uh, per cycle. Whereas the AMH test can be ran at any time in the cycle. It is a reflection of the number of follicles in deep sleep. So these are the primordial microscopic follicles that are not yet in play. With increasing age, the size of that pool reduces. Therefore, the blood measurable AMH reduces. And AMH is fairly constant throughout a monthly cycle. So you don't have to wait when you're ovulating or wait till your period is over. You can have AMH checked at any time and it will give an indication as to what to do. So there are many assisted fertility options available to patients. And they're also, you know, they'll come under different nomenclatures such as assisted reproductive technologies or ART. Um, and you have the entry level stuff like ovulation induction, then you have intrauterine insemination, also called gamete intrafallopian uh, transfer or gift. And then you have IVF, uh, which plus embryo transfer. And then nowadays we see more and more ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where they put simply a sperm directly into the egg. And obviously more commonly as well is FET, which is frozen embryo transfer. So you'll see a patient go through maybe one IVF cycle and they'll harvest as many eggs as they can from which they'll produce embryos. And then they'll put those remaining embryos on ice for use later on. So we look at them quickly one by one. When it comes to ovulation induction, it is simply the process of using medicines to stimulate ovulation. It's done if the patient has irregular ovulation or has absent ovulation. So regular ovulation is defined as cycle lengths around 21 to 34 days. But if your cycle length is any longer than 35 days, that is considered irregular and problematic. Absent ovulation comes along with certain conditions like PCOS, of course, excessive exercise and certain nutritional problems, maybe eating disorders or things like that. <clears throat> the medications used, you've seen them being dispensed, such as Clomid, Letrozole, Femara, Metformin for your uh, PCOS patients. And then in at specialist level, you'll see very low dose gonadotropins, FSH or LH plus a trigger. But once you go down the road of the gonadotropins, you have to have increased monitoring because there's a higher risk of OHSS, which we'll come to later on, and risk of multiple pregnancies. With ovulation induction, the goal is to increase the chance of conception through either natural sexual intercourse or IUI, which is the next tier up. Um, sometimes if a patient has an underlying condition that's treated, it can jumpstart the ovulation. In, typically with ovulation induction, you'll see them use the oral medications. This says day three to day seven, but most of the scripts I would dispense would be day two to day six. And I'm sure you'll see some different things yourselves. When it comes to IUI, this is direct transfer of collected sperm to the uterus. The goal is to overcome some of the causes of infertility by placing the sperm near the mature egg or eggs. Uh, during ovulation. It is often used in, say, donor sperm cycles of younger hetero couples and younger female couples. <clears throat> the key here is younger. IOI is not done uh, predominantly in older uh, aged lady cycles because um, it's less likely to be successful. There are more factors affecting why someone cannot get pregnant when they've passed the age of 35. When it comes to IVF, it is the collection of a woman's eggs and a man's sperm, which are then combined together outside of the body. In vitro is simply the Latin for in glass. So they're combined together in the petri, glass Petri dish. The eggs are fertilized and monitored. They become embryos and the best embryo or embryos are transferred to the uterus. Successful implantation of the embryo will result in a pregnancy. Um, with IVF, Basically, for want of a better way of saying it, 
the sperm is collected, it's cleaned off from the double head and two tail as a process it can be put through. And literally it, it is applied to the Petri dish, which will contain the various eggs collected from the lady. It may contain one egg per dish, it may contain two eggs per dish, it may contain more. So it then becomes a numbers game. The sperm still with the application of a current compete to penetrate the egg. So there's an element of natural selection still, of course. Um, you know, so there's a very high success rate. I remember about 10 years ago, I'd say 90% of IVF cycles was simple IVF and 10% only was ICSI, which is coming in a moment. In terms of oocyte or egg collection, it's done through the vagina with a needle directly into the ovary and the uh, eggs are sucked back into a liquid medium which is then they're then taken from that and applied to the petri dish so the consultant will track the position of the needle and the follicles which contain the eggs on ultrasound and uh, they're very skilled at this of course uh, some of these eggs will be good some will be not so good when it comes to ICSI which is kind of like the gold standard it's like the ultimate is a huge percentage positive uh, fertilization rate because you remove the difficulties that the sperm may have in penetrating the egg if the egg has a tough outer shell. You remove the difficulties of uh, previous IVF failures, maybe on an IUI cycle or an ovulation induction cycle. You're taking and identifying a single sperm and placing it in a single egg. <clears throat> and uh, it's very successful. So comparing Traditional IVF with ICSI, you can see here on the dish, the egg under microscopy surrounded by all the sperm and the sperm then is competing to penetrate the egg. The sperm sample was collected. The egg was collected. They are both applied to the Petri dish with the use of a current and then you wait. With ICSI, the sperm sample is collected. A single sperm is uh, identified and placed inside a single egg. So intracytoplasmic sperm injection is, the sperm is placed directly into the cytoplasm of the egg. When it comes to fertilization embryo development, it follows this course. Day one is the pro-nuclear stage. Day two, you'd have four cells. Day three, you'll have eight cells. Day four, a compact marula. And day five is the very special blastocyst. And this basically is the emerging embryo. Up to that, it, you know, at any point, you can see this happening and then start to fail. But when you get to here, you're as far along as you want to be and you're ready for um, transfer back to, to, to the lady. When it comes to embryo transfer, the embryo is identified from the Petri dish and then into the vagina, it's placed all the way up in the uterus. And it kind of comes out in a little bubble of fluid, of course. <clears throat> so we'll talk about the phase in a minute. So FET has been very advantageous for a lot of patients. Um, it's cryopreservation or embryo freezing. It's the freezing and storing of unused embryos. These are then later thawed for use. It allows patients to save time and money because you might not have to go through repeated additional egg collection retrieval cycles or repeated stimulation cycles. The stimulation cycles are, are very taxing and there's a lot of lab process and clinic involvement. So if you've gone through a cycle and you've enough embryos collected and they're of sufficient quality, freezing them and using them if that cycle didn't work or for a later cycle if that worked, um, is very advantageous and FET cycles are far less medication heavy because you're not doing all the stimulation stuff, you're not doing all the preparatory stuff, you're just doing the luteal support which I'll talk about in a minute. So and FET is used uh, practically in many situations like cancer, you know, if a patient has cancer, like a, a male patient has cancer, they, you know, they might donate their sperm which could be frozen, the partner might go through a FET cycle. I, I remember distinctly a patient going through a cycle where they ran an IVF cycle before engaging in the cancer treatment, which was then probably going to take their womb and other things like that. And they had their embryos, which they could then use in a surrogate, you know, so incredible things that can happen. 
uh, FET is very helpful with advancing age. So I've seen scenarios where uh, I can think of a, a lady, high profile um, barrister that came and harvested her eggs and used donor sperm and froze the embryos because she hadn't met Mr. or Mrs. Wright yet and didn't know yet where she wanted to have kids, but she was banking her options because having the pregnancy later in life is okay. The conception, the age of the egg is was the rate limiting step previously. So, um, you know, and then people maybe who were going off to war or something like that uh, in America, it's quite common that if, if someone has to go off to war that they might do this. Um, I think there was even, a if anyone watches Grey's Anatomy, there was something Grey's Anatomy a couple of weeks ago about this, where the partner was going to die and the lady was had the option of having the embryo. So effect brings a lot of advantages. So when it comes to ovarian stimulation protocols, there's two kind of ways that they're looked at. There's an agonist protocol, which was typically called a long cycle. And then there's an antagonist protocol, which is typically called a short cycle. And this is then placed beside each other. So in the long cycle, you get down regulation of endogenous hormones. And then you start a cycle. You have your FSH stimulation. You have your trigger day 12, egg collection around here, and embryo transfer around day 19, etc. With the short cycle, you don't do any down regulation. You jump straight in first, first day of the menstrual bleed with the injection starting day two or three. Then they bring in anywhere from day five to day eight, the antagonists, and they will block the LH surge, which I'll show you now in a minute graphically. The trigger is still around the same days, usually day 12, day 14, etc egg collection day 14 to day 16 and embryo transfer day 18 to day 20 it varies patient by patient and clinic and times and things like that okay the short cycles are mainly what are used in ireland nowadays uh, i remember again 10 years ago it was nearly all agonist cycles and i'll explain the difference in a minute um but we've gone away from those. There was more problems with the agonist cycles and I'll explain them in a minute. The biggest problem for Ireland is that the majority of patients presenting are 38 years of age on average. So the majority are presenting over age 35 with many on average being 38 or 38 plus. So they tend to go for these cycles uh, with high level of stimulation, okay? When it comes to an actual cycle, there's three phases, as I like to think of it. There's the preparation phase, and I think of that usually pre-injection. The stimulation phase, which is the controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, uh, the injections commence. And then there's the luteal phase post-embryo transfer, which is the injections may be finished unless the patient is using a progesterone subcut or something like that. But the stim injections are gone, the triggers are gone, if the patient's older, they could be on a clexane or something like that, but often with the luteal phase, um, it's just progesterone support, okay? This is probably my favorite thing in my consultation room. It lives in here, laminated, and it comes out for every cycle to walk a patient through it. But I'll walk you through it the way I walk them through it. So on day one of their period, their womb breaks down and it breaks down over roughly a week. And then it starts to rebuild itself again, ready for a potential pregnancy. At an ovarian level, the ovary identifies a follicle. The follicle is then stimulated by your follicle stimulating hormone and your luteinizing hormone. The follicle matures and swells and gets bigger. You then have an LH surge, which triggers ovulation, the follicle ruptures and the egg is released and it travels down the fallopian tube. Now, naturally then, please God, egg meets sperm and you end up with a, a successful pregnancy. And of course, many things can go wrong along the way. We'll come back to this slide after we discuss the medicines, okay? But this is basically a typical um, cycle for a lady. Most of the women I talk to don't have 28 day cycles, including my wife. So, you know, it depends on the patients. This is the textbook. It doesn't always go like that. There are women who ovulate early. There are women who ovulate late. And um, there are women who won't mature a follicle in a cycle, who don't ovulate in a cycle. There are many different reasons. There are 
women with low estrogen, which isn't helpful when you look at the role of estrogen through the cycle. So there are different reasons why all of this happens or goes wrong. When it comes to the medicines, and I mean, we could talk for hours about the medicines, but basically there's preparatory ones. Then we have our gonadotropins and our menotropins. So your FSH and your LH. We have our uh, gonadotropin uh, antagonists and agonists. We have our triggers, which are human chorionic gonadotropin, but also you have agonist triggers, and then we have luteal support. So when it comes to preparatory medicines, you'll often see prescriptions for the pill. All the pill is for, is not to prevent pregnancy, is to time the cycle. So the lady will start this on day one of her period and she may take it, they'll often prescribe two packs. She might take it for 10 days, 17 days, 31 days, but the clinic decides. And basically the day she stops taking it, she will have the first day of her bleed five days later. And that's when her stim phase will start. The pill is simply to time the natural cycle to the clinic's timetable. They can't have people need an egg collection on Saturdays, Sundays. You know, it's just time. That's it. Test the gel is used an awful lot now. The lady gets a full sachet for five consecutive days and it provides an androgen boost. It basically opens the receptors on the good follicles, making them more receptive and stimulated. Uh, ready for stimulation from FSH and LH, okay? So that's what it's used for. It only is used for five days. It doesn't improve the quality of the egg, but it brings better eggs forward. So it's taught, you could say it's like an improved egg. It doesn't, it brings better egg forward, okay? Obviously you'll see prenatal vitamins and folic acid, of course. Coenzyme Q10, you know, I always used to look, look at this and think, well, it's powerful antioxidants. It's there to mop up free radicals. You know, it does all of that, but it's not, it, it's, not its role in, in IVF. Um, it has many different roles, but ultimately when, when the different clinics look at success rates, they find that there are better pregnancy outcomes when this antioxidant is used as part of cycles. Vitamin D, as we know, is a role in immune systems and immune health. It's not here for bone reasons or because they're deficient. It's here to immune related. And one you might see on uh, cycles then is the DHEA, so dehydroepiandosterone. So this acts like the testosterone, except patients need to take it for six to eight weeks before their cycle, and it will achieve the same net result as the test gel. It will improve the sensitivity of the best follicles before stimulation. It also, there's another role for it as well, which has gone out of my head, but I remember a consultant described it to me, it like it turns back the clock on the eggs, but that's not what it does because that's not possible. It brings the better eggs forward, but the test gel is a simpler, shorter way of doing it. And they do it literally in the five days when they stop the oral contraceptive. FSH then is the first uh, gonadotropin that we look at. It spurns, it spurs on the development and growth of the eggs in a woman's ovaries. It also stimulates sperm production in men. So men who have low sperm, sometimes it's used. Okay. The various folytropins that we have on the market, we've alpha and delta. Gone left was the originator. There's now Recoval. There's Bemfolo as a generic of gone left. Uh, FSH on its own, I used to see an awful lot of it. I see a lot less of it now because I see it combined in combination products. Pergovirus, which is a synthetic FSH-LH combination where you have two is to one FSH-LH. Menopore is uh, taken uh, from urine and that's a one is to one concentration. The FSH is used in younger patients on its own. But once the patient age exceeds 35, you're not going to see FSH on its own. You're going to see FSH and L LH because that's what's needed to stimulate proper development. Uh, the pergovirus is what I, it's gassed, whatever your consultant is near you, they have a penchant and they use a certain drug so that we use an awful lot of pergovirus here. <clears throat> Luteinizing hormone 
treatment, as I said, it's used less in Ireland due to the age of the patients presenting. It used to be available or still is available in Luveris and in the, um, the FSH only kind of uh, cycles, you'll only see a low dose LH with it, like maybe 75 units. Whereas in the Pergovirus cycle that I see a lot of, I see 450 units a day. So that's 450 FSH, 225 LH. And then you'll see some menopause cycles where it'll be 450 units a day. And that's 450 FSH, 450 LH. And again, that's older patients. Now, the risk when you're using LH, if you remember that graph, is the LH spike, and that triggers ovulation. So you don't want premature ovulation. So they use agonists and antagonists. So the agonists were the old, longer cycles. And what they used to do with the agonist was it was an aphorellin spray, the Cineril, or you had a Bussarellin Superfact spray and even an injection. The Continents used Luprorellin or Gosserellin, which is your decapeptals and, and things like that. In Ireland, we used the Cineril at the time. It suppresses the premature LH surge during, that comes during the stim phase, the stimulation phase, but it had many disadvantages. It had a really long downreg required. They had to do it for two or three weeks before starting their stim cycle. It left the ladies with really low estrogen. It caused more cysts. And then you needed higher dose FSH during your stim phase to get your follicles. And there were, there were negatives. There was more OHSS, more ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome. But despite those negatives, higher pregnancy rates resulted. So it was widely used and widely accepted because ultimately it's about improving the chances of, of getting pregnant. Then we invented the antagonists. So these are Ganorelix, which was Orgolutrin, and Cetrorelix, which is Cetratide. These were touted as side effect free. <clears throat> um, they have an immediate mode of action. Um, so the patient only needed a shorter period of administration. So anywhere between four and 10 days maximum, often around seven, you know. Um, there was a huge decrease in the risk of hospital admissions due to OHSS with the antagonist, but yet there was no decrease in pregnancy rates compared with the, the long cycles. So this nearly is the treatment of choice going forward. I can't remember the last time I had a long cycle prescription. Um, and we, you know, we do an awful lot. So I think this mainly is the protocol of choice that they do it every now and then to short cycles. When it comes to triggers, there's many different ways that we can trigger ovulation. <clears throat> Ovitrel HCG is a recombinant one. It's six and a half thousand units of HCG. It's completely synthetic. Whereas you probably would have seen Ganassi and you might remember Pregnal, they were, uh, Ganassi anyway is, is unlicensed. Each amp is roughly 5,000 units. This is urinary derived, so it's more natural. So consultants that prefer to mimic more natural hormones tend to go for this. Uh, that goes back to the menopause and Pergovirus argument. So some consultants don't mind that it's synthetic in nature and other consultants prefer to be more natural. So you might see them using the menopause instead of the Pergovirus or the gone left. And then the same consultants will often put Ganassi on the prescription, not Avitrel. What's used also then on occasion sometimes is an agonist trigger. And an agonist trigger is where you use a, sh a shot of Bussarellin on alternate days for three days instead of an Ovitrel or instead of a Ganassi. And this is often done if the lady has too many follicles because the Ovitrel and the Ganassi are too powerful if they have an awful lot of follicles. They'll use the agonist trigger instead. But what you often see a lot of now, and nearly every script I see at the moment, is Avitrel plus a single stat shot, a 0.5 mil of Bussarellin injection, super fact. And that it's a, the consultant said to me, it's a synergized trigger. We just see better trigger outcomes for it. And when a patient uses their trigger, if you're ever asked questions about timing, ovulation occurs roughly 36 to 42 hours later so the clinic might tell the patient to use the trigger at half nine on a wednesday night and they're going to be in the clinic friday a.m for their egg collection you know so th that's the rough timelines when it comes to additional medication that you'll see in prescriptions you'll nearly always see zithromax for men one gram stat dose before their sperm donation uh, it just cleans it down. It's part of that prep phase. 
you'll see doxycycline for women either as a two-day course starting the day before egg collection or some clinics will do it twice daily 50, 100 milligram once a day for two days or 50 milligram twice a day for five days starting before egg collection it's just consultant differences you'll see aspirin the role of aspirin actually actually is probably one of the only ones that has evidence for it it actually can reduce the risk of risk of miscarriage you'll see prednisolone i used to think that it was to suppress the immune system because some people's bodies treat pregnancy like infection and this is true but um it has other roles you'll see clexane patients could be older they're getting a lot of hormones you'll see femitab and estrofem in really high doses usually six milligram or eight milligram per day and it has to be at that level to suppress the negative feedback to the pituitary gland you might see estradiol patches again these people are older the levels are falling are, are falling so they'll push them up <clears throat> In terms of luteal support, so this is post embryo transfer. The licensed products in Ireland are crinone gel, should always be used twice daily, vaginally, or lutinous, uh, 100 milligram vaginal tabs three times a day. Uh, don't see much lutinous, the patients used to give out about it because of a chalky discharge. So nearly all scripts are crinone at the moment, or cyclogest, which is a, an unlicensed pessary. But you, you'll see. The content prescribed 200 milligram three times a day. You'll see subcut um, Prolutex or Lubion, which is progesterone injections. You might see uh, Crinone once a day and Prolutex in the evening. It's where the lady is not maintaining her progesterone levels, so the injection is a bit more of a boost. But the one that's probably the best here, but is the most awkward because it requires patients to do intramuscular, is progesterone and oil. It's done less because it's intramuscular, but for women who can't maintain good progesterone levels to the clinic's uh, liking, they will prescribe them this. Now, novel approaches when it comes to this, I have to say that 98 of 100 prescriptions, you won't, you, you'll see them fall within a short agonist cycle with roughly the same meds coming on it. But sometimes you'll see cycles that could use growth hormone to enhance uh, the quality of egg that comes forward. And sometimes you'll see IVIG to boost the immune system. And sometimes you'll see Nupogen to improve the receptivity of the uterus for the embryo. You might see intracyte gel. And a couple of years ago, there were consultants trying to throw embryo at patients. I have to stress that in these scenarios, they are the 1% or 2%, which they can't put a finger on us. They're, they're, they have a patient who's willing to push a bit harder. They've been to a conference and they're talking about new research, but the evidence is, is lacking to show very strong use across all cycles. So, so they're, they're once-offs more than the norm, okay? Back to the my favorite little laminated sheet. So I would walk a patient through when they start their FSH, LH, that we are pushing these levels up and we were asking the ovaries to identify as many follicles as safely as possible and mature them. And as you walk along, then you will use your trigger shots, shot or shots. So it could be the Ovitrel and the Bussarellin or whatever it is. This induces ovulation, which they'll then attend for egg collection within uh, 36 to 42 hours. And then they come back for embryo transfer. And the only thing that's needed in that part of the cycle is progesterone okay so they find that very helpful when we go that walk through and i tend to take all the products out on the table and move them away as they're finished in in the cycle quick word on ohss so it's an exaggerated response to excess hormones caused by the stimulatory drugs it can cause significant side effects which range in mild to severe reactions around four percent of patients will get it quite severely um, it's to do with accumulation of fluid in the ovaries in the abdomen and from that you can have the things that we get in the body when we've accumulation of fluid like shortness of breath stomach pain swelling <laughs> it, because the fluid is being pulled by the ohss you can have a decrease in urination uh, it can be quite serious if it's not managed so it's important that us as pharmacists if our patients are telling us they have these weird symptoms that we instruct them to check with their clinics, you know. Of course, um, to conclude now, I just want to talk a little bit about treatment abroad because um, 
patients and of course, of course access treatment abroad. EU prescriptions are valid across all member states, uh, as you know, but the high tech medicines need to be transcribed. There's this thing that the HSC PCRS called the mirror prescription. The patient will have to have their GP transcribe the high tech medicines in particular. You don't need to transcribe for aspirins or anything that's not a high tech. That script is valid in Ireland. Um, but the high tech stuff needs a mirror prescription. And then once you send that to the PCRS with the foreign uh, clinic prescription, you'll get a HTX high tech number, which will allow you to order the medicine. Um, now, prescriptions from outside of the EU, like America or possibly even the UK, now I'm not even sure I haven't seen any UK scripts since Brexit and COVID, of course, but scripts from anywhere outside of Europe they're third countries, they're not valid prescriptions in Ireland and the patient will need to attend uh, an Irish, an Ireland based consultant to transcribe it to high tech. There's no mechanism for taking someone who's choosing treatment in New York and accessing high tech medicines in Ireland. It's outside of the European Union. And years ago, I had a patient who was going to New York for gender selection. They had two girls. They were going to have one more pregnancy and they would have liked to have a, have a boy and had the means. So they went for their treatment in New York and a consultant in Dublin was their prescribing conduit here to allow them to get the STEM meds. And then they traveled to New York. Her successful story, she ended up having twin boys. So, you know, now this is uh, just a little email. This is who you send your farm prescription to uh, the hub. And as you can see here, they ask you to get a mirror script. And then once you submit the mirror script, the foreign script, they'll give you a HTX number and you can go ahead and order your meds. The more worry that I would have about foreign prescriptions from clinics like Gannett and Prague is they don't often give any directions. So you see that clearly you want to order three gone left, one Avitrel, five uh, Cetratide and six cycle just 200s right but everything is the protocol so as per the protocol so i always ask my patients for a copy of their protocol because then i can properly counsel and label their medicines as to what they have to do and they use this system of zero zero one so one is evening administrations one here is a morning administration this is a three times day administration so it's very simple for the for the patient to follow day by day but i always ask for this so i know what the clinic is doing because I do not put as directed on any of my labels. It's just not safe. So in conclusion, when it comes to fertility and if you're fielding questions from patients, really the sooner the better. Um, time waits for none of us and age is the biggest, biggest, most important factor when it comes to success. It's important to view that the fertility treatments are not about increasing uh, the patient's fertility, but it's about increasing their chances of conceiving and having a live birth, which is the goal. Uh, because every person and every couple is different. It is absolutely an individualized approach. You'll see commonalities in the prescriptions, and then you'll see stuff that you, you don't know where the consultant is going. And most of the clinics will have their own guidance, their own, this is the AMH, this is the antral follicle count, so this is the units I'll go with. You won't find them in a standardized protocol that should all be followed. They're going off their own evidence and they're all competing with each other and they're bashing each other to say they're better than the next, you know? So there's huge variation in, in the prescriptions from patient to patient, to clinic to clinic. But ultimately you should be able to boil it back into is this a long cycle, a short cycle? As far as I'm concerned, it's always gonna be a short cycle. What's the trigger? What's the stimulatory drugs? What are the associated um, other medicines for? Um, cycles can often be prolonged or amended due to various reasons. So you could have people who are given seven days of their cetratide and all of a sudden they're back looking for three more. So some of the clinics that we work with, they always put a repeat by one and it's for the scenario that the cycle will be extended and I can go back to the hub and order more uh, medicines if it has to be extended for whatever reason. Patients must go for repeated scanning during cycles. So if they're inadequately responding to the stimulatory meds, they could be pushed up mid-cycle. If they're over-responding, they could be asked to dial it down. There's, there's all, it's a dynamic process. It's not going to follow a set straight, this is it, okay? Uh, thanks a million for listening. I hope you found that helpful. Thanks very much, Jonathan.
that was really interesting very complicated area yeah. um and i think we'll all agree that we we sometimes get a bit of the fear when we see these scripts coming in because they can be very complicated um i'll i'll wait for questions coming in but i suppose just to to start with a comment i have i really like your idea of taking down your laminated sheet um yeah. and walking through the patient uh through the cycle in your experience are are all your patients really clued in to exactly what's going on do they retain that information or do you find them yourself fielding questions and and kind of having to work through cycles a lot with people oh there's a massive variation massive you have people who have read everything and are almost trying to tell you how it goes and they can be set in their ways and that could be a challenge to reverse them back up a lot of them do know what they're at you get lay people who've never given an injection and they have to give an injection so i spend a lot of time coaching on how to inject how to do a subcut injection um you know the support literature from the two main companies are merck and fairing right and Mark give this fabulous little card and the patient can QR scan that. So this is gone left, Pergovirus, Ovitrile, Crinon, and they can see videos on how to step by step. So they can watch it again and again and again, you know, and that can inform them. So I'll have ran through it with them, but then I'll say, this is where you need to go to be, if you forget. Because it's information overload. You're taking something that's really complex. You have 10 or 15 minutes. They're not going to remember everything. Mm -hmm. So when I give them that, that's they go to that. And then they still might ring back and go, do you remember you said I have to do my trigger on this day? Uh, how do I do that again? You know, because it could be a month before they do it. So it's a variance. Yeah. There's a lot of, of comment in the chat about your laminated sheet. Yeah. Where, can you remember where you got it? Or did you find it somewhere? Oh, yeah. Well, it's in the lecture, so when you put it up, they can, they can have it there. It. Yeah, <laughs> it's really hard. It's it, you know, I think it's hard to find really good graphics where you have the overlay of the hormones yeah. and everything on it. Well, I would tell everyone, right? This is Merck's one, so this is a little tear off. They're all the same. All right. Right. Yeah. So if they annoy the Merck rep, okay, <laughs> you can get a box of the cards, some of this, crinol leaflets, alcohol wipes which you don't need as we all know you don't need alcohol wipe if you're clean you can get lots of support material there's yeah. even a little booklet on how to uh, administer crinone properly so it depicts a woman lying on her side forming a position and inserting it inside the vagina so they can give you all that so the patients get a tear out of all of that and again it's not to replace what i've told them when we walk through it they get the best understanding because we slow it all down right but when they go away and they go, God, that was mad, wasn't it? They have something that they can look back on and be reminded. You yeah, know? yeah, that's a good tip about the, the stuff you can get through your rep. Yeah, thanks for that. So I have a question come in. It's a little bit long, so just bear with me as I try and condense yeah. it. Um, in ICS high, is it up to yeah. the, the technician to select the sperm to inject into the egg cytoplasm? Yeah. Uh, not natural selection being applied, um, but artificial selection. So commentary maybe on ethical issues. I don't know if you want to comment on that. And then what's the legislation regarding sperm donor in Ireland? Can children have access to donor info? I'm not sure if you're comfortable with that, if that's beyond the scope, it's up to you, well, Jonathan. The, the, the ICSI one, it is, as it said, it, it's not 100% natural selection. The, the uh, technician, which could be an embryologist, you know, based on experience and presentation of the sperm is making a decision and is putting that inside the egg. Um, for the patients who enter these processes, I mean, they'd set their hair on fire to come out the right side of it, you know? They're, they're willing to do anything. Um, so they don't tend to concern themselves with, you know, maybe the ethics of it. They just want to know that hopefully, please God, they'll have a happy live birth at the end of it, you know? And um, when it comes to the access to information, I, I don't know that. I know a lot of patients, our donor sperm in Ireland primarily comes from Denmark, okay? And I, as far as I know, and I can't, I, I'm trying to remember what the donor egg situation is around. It may not even be going on. I know that people go to Prague for that a lot. Um, so, but again, being able to access that information, I don't think that's a question that me as a pharmacist is having with the conversation with the patient. It's interesting, 
but I don't think they're not worried about that when they're filling their prescription. Thanks for that. Um, so there's another question come in about the antibiotics uh, for males before. Um, is that always done or is that optional? So uh, for Jason, isn't it? Yeah, Jason, that it, again is clinic dependent. So the clinic that are nearest to me at the moment, every gentleman giving a sperm sample takes Citramax and they have their evidence as to why they want that. And again, the lady is using the doxycycline the day before egg collection, the day of egg collection. But other clinics maybe don't offer anything for the men, do you know? And I can think of a clinic in Dublin, we won't mention any names, but their prescription can be 18 lines long. And the clinic local to me, the entire prescription will be six lines long, you know? So why is one 18 lines long and why is one six lines long? And that's just consultants, differences, opinions, you know, what they think will work. They're all trying to outcompete each other. So they attend the conference and they could read something that this has a huge uh, extra help or, or role but it you know it'll play out in their own stats which aren't released um the question about when products go into short supply um what would you do do you refer back to the clinic or or how do you approach that usually yeah it depends on the short supply so i haven't had an issue with sort short supply from the types of medicines I've seen prescribed, they're regular line medicines. So, you know, we're not running into difficulties with them. The manufacturers who have them know how many they need to have in Ireland at any one time. It, it happened a while ago that there was, when we used to have a product used a lot called Puragon. Puragon wasn't available. I think it's Folytrop and Beta. So everyone was just switched to Menopur. But yes, the patient will either have started their cycle uh, and they have their meds or they haven't started their my cycle and the medicines that were prescribed are not available and if they're not it's a new protocol mm, yeah. you can't give them what you can't get yeah um it's a question about the role of naltrexone on a script yeah so again i've seen some clinics in dublin using it it upregulates part of the the endorphins in the body the good endorphins so i don't know what a lot of evidence there is for it it's unfortunately like a lot of the stuff, it's not commonly used. It, I think it's the one to 2% of cycles. It's not the, the 95 plus percent of cycles, but naltrexone like its use in MS and uh, is supposed to increase positive endorphins, which, uh, you know, if you have a lot of negative endorphins, they're damaging. So I think that's its role. Thank you. Um, so I've, uh kind of a lengthy question come in from Laura. I'm not sure if you can find it in the chat box. There mm. are kind of multiple parts to it. Um, it might be easier for you to read it. Uh, so yeah, hi Laura. No, it's not that less eggs will be retrieved, right? So if a patient, like PCOS patients tend to have a huge amount of follicles, but very small follicles. And these follicles don't necessarily mature very, very well, right? As an example. So I had a patient today who I was chatting with a consultant, a consultant about, and she was prescribed an Ovitrel trigger and a, and a Bussarel in synergy of 0.5 mil. But because she had a high proportion of matured follicles, they were afraid that if they used the Ovitrel, that you would get, it would lead to OHSS, fluid retention and a massive uh, burst. So they went for a weaker trigger because it was all they needed. She had plenty of follicles, they were ready to go. They didn't need the powerful Avitra. That's how he described it to me, word for word. And coenzyme Q10, no, its role is not for egg retrieval. I need to look that up. I have it in a message from the consultant about two weeks ago. I'm after forgetting what Maybe it was. Maybe what we could I'll do is, what, yeah, we can add it to some sure. footnotes when we release the, the presentation. Yeah. Would that be that, yeah. that might be a good idea? So there's a question about transferring um, the EU scripts onto high tech scripts, and yeah. should that be done by a GP or just the consultant? GP, GP. So a prescription from anywhere in Europe, patient goes to the GP. The GP literally just has to write the product. They can write as directed after everything. They don't have to interpret it. They don't have to cross-check doses, take any responsibility for it. It's just a matter of process and it can be a GP. Thanks for that. Okay, um, question, if a woman is having her eggs frozen for future fertilization, how many eggs would be collected? 
So th this is a good question, and, and, and I'll just define this. To my knowledge, no future pregnancy ever resulted from a frozen egg. You can only freeze embryos. So the woman has to go through a stimulation cycle to collect her eggs, which are then fertilized, and the embryos are frozen. The eggs are not frozen for future fertilization. Okay. Thanks for that. So the question from Jeannie about unlicensed meds, if patients yeah. um, GMS uh, applying for hardship um, for Ganassi or DHEA, would they pay? Would, do you have experience with applying for hardship, I suppose? Uh, not much, no. I have to say, I have patients who have, who have GMS coming through the system. So basically, you can dispense the high-tech high -tech prescription as a GMS. You don't have to apply for a DPS. That's fine. But the associated medicines like the Yasmin, the Cyclogest, which have codes, you know, um, all those other things that have codes, their own GMS doctor needs to transcribe, and then you can claim for it on the GMS. Um, the, it, 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 the easiest way around this is if a consultant is going for Ganassi, which is a ULM, they can be encouraged to go for Avitral, which is a licensed product. If the consultant is going for DHEA, which is a ULM, and there's no logic list, listening to my consultant. You have to do it for six to eight weeks instead of five days of test gel. Test gel is licensed and has a code. Do you know, so there's ways around it. And if the if the patient and there are a smaller percentage of patients presenting, that might change when we see the hubs up and going. But for the moment, it, it, it's one in thirty, one in forty of my patients or couples who are who are GMS patients. So it's it's not a huge issue that I've come across. And often they have just paid for it because it's easier. Because with hardship, you have to apply for it, wait for approval before you give it. Because you can get stung if you give it first off on the chance that it will be paid for when it mightn't. Thank you. Okay, there's a question from Coach. Um, I'm going to mess up pronouncing this drug, I think. Yeah, <laughs> so I'll leave you to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, uh, Coach, in relation to this, you're looking at the one or two percent. I also have seen, is not Tyvens, I think it's called Tyvens. I have seen that on uh, IVF scripts as well. Again, you're talking about older patients. My patient was 40 plus. It's a stimulant. So there, there's a, a pathway of logic for the consultant to use this. And um, I haven't looked into the evidence around it. Um, but the, again, you're talking about the one or two percenters. You're not talking about someone who's, whose fertility journey is playing ball or going like the majority of patients. You're talking about the outliers and the consultant is doing their best to try and help the patient. Um, but again, I don't know where the evidence is at. Okay. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to um, stop, the stop the recording. Um...